so the, in this demo, I'm trying to um, I go from an existing uh, model using TensorFlow that's called StyleGAN. It's from NVIDIA. And I uh, change the notebook in Jupyter so that it uses object storage because it's designed to use file system. So let, let me get going. So just to set the stage, um, so this is a loading TensorFlow. Uh, I have a Docker container in one of my machine that's running an uh, NVIDIA card, uh, 1080 Ty. So that's a kind of beefy enough that we can do this. Um, so this is getting initialized over here. Um, uh, so this is the architecture of the network I'm going to be using. I'm not going to go into the details, but you basically give it a point in space and it's going to create a realistic face from it. Right? Uh, and then we're going to have something with, uh, with all of that. I have the object store is uh, on uh, Arteska. Uh, it's actually running on a virtual machine for the sake of the uh, demo. Uh, I'm just importing Arteska as a Python library, which is just a standard S3 client, but I'm doing all the uh, key management and authentication uh, inside of that module. And let me show you what it looks like. I have this um, Arteska service uh, on that VM. Um, it's basically, it takes the VM, install Kubernetes on it, and deploy Arteska as a Kubernetes uh, application on top. So I have one node. So this is the Kubernetes side of things, where I have a, a node. Uh, this is in the Arteska UI, uh, made of multiple volumes. So internally, we use things like um, Kafka, uh, Prometheus for stats. So all of these uh, are part of, of the uh, deployment. Uh, they help us build a storage service. And I can show you all my different drives, or all virtual drives that I'm aggregating to make one object store. And at the end of this, I have an S3 compatible object store that I can play with. So in that object store, I have a bucket uh, where I have loaded the models we're gonna use today. And I've also loaded some um, data point that we're going to play with. Okay, so if I go back to the, to the notebook, so now I'm going to load this from the object store. So as opposed to loading from a file, I'm actually opening a bucket and loading the data directly from my uh, Arteska system. So that's initializing. So the beauty of this is I don't need any storage uh, on my um, compute node. And if I were to have multiple compute nodes, they can all share the same object storage service. So they don't need to deploy their own storage. So that's loaded some utility function. So just checking if this works, I'm gonna show some random people from uh, the, uh, the engine and it's working. So these are all people that don't exist that the uh, model was able to, uh, to generate. I'm sorry, I just wanted to confirm, those are not real people. Yeah, these are fake people. Yeah, okay. yeah. You can just generate some more. Okay. Um, so now what we did before the, uh, the presentation was take pictures of uh, me and some volunteer delegates and Paul and Giorgio, uh, Paul and Brad, and we go into, we did the opposite. Uh, from the picture, find me the point in the vector space that will generate something that looks like us. Uh, there's also that the space we're in has some, uh, a lot of structure and there's some axes you can play with. So smiling, gender, age, there's a lot of things you can do and modify. So for the sake of the, uh, the demo, I'm loading everything from uh, Arteska, from the object store. So none of that was on the server before we did the, we tried this. So let me go ahead. So this is kind of the original picture of Brad and what the uh, point the uh, engine was able to find. So it's pretty realistic. That's me 10 years ago and, uh, and Paul as well. You see that on me, uh, the original data set doesn't have a lot of people with my ethnicity. <laughs> so it has a hard time with my fuzzy hair. It kind of makes me uh, non-curly, but that's okay. So let's go ahead and, and play with some of this, uh, uh, this data. So I'm going to take this and have a smile a little bit more because our company photographer doesn't like us to smile in picture. It's always close smile. So if you want to have an open smile, that's what you would do. Uh, we can also play with other axes. Uh, this one is the gender axis. Some disturbing pictures. <laughs> <laughs> that is truly <laughs> disturbing, I must say. And as a data scientist, uh, I might want to explore the data set and find some interesting points that I want to share with uh, colleagues. So if I go ahead and 
do some uh, arithmetic on this point. So I can take from Paul to Giorgio, from Paul to Brad, from Brad to me. I can also take the average of Paul and Brad and, and, and see what happens. So if I do this, let's see. So some more disturbing pictures. Um, so the, the top is Paul and Giorgio blended yeah. somewhere in the middle. Got it. And let's say that I like this data point a lot and I want to go from this one to, to me. So I think I'm interested into that data point, uh, again, the middle. So let me uh, store it and let's put that bigger. So that's the mix of all three of us. I think it's pretty, pretty accurate. <laughs> <laughs> pretty wild. That guy could run Scality if uh, we were to have a problem. Mm -hmm. uh, so now I'm gonna, so this is like the, um, exploring phase of uh, um, machine learning. What I want to do is export it and share that with somebody else. So I'm going to um, export that data point and store it into the Arteska object store. And I'm adding some specific tags. So uh, three tags, one is a very important person. Uh, this was generated and I'm giving the host name because I could have a farm of uh, uh, compute node and I, I may wanna know which node created that uh, particular data. So that's what I'm doing, it's being stored. So if I go to um, my UI over here, I can go and uh, find the data by looking at all the different data points, or I can do a metadata search. So this was generated from a certain node. So if I look for that tag into the system, uh, it's going to reply with an index search on the actual data point that I just uploaded. Uh, so you can do metadata search on any attribute that you added yourself and also on any um, storage attributes. So I can look for all the keys that uh, end with the NPY, which is the format of my, my data export. I can look at when I put data, I actually tag it with which one is the latest model because in deep learning, you may generate new models and try to get the latest one. So I can just go and find which was the latest version of my model and play with it because it has a specific tag of latest revision over here. Uh, I can also look at any large file into the system and that will give me my models because they are the largest uh, pieces of the system. So with tagging a metadata search, you can quickly isolate uh, the data you want to work with. Uh, and as Brad and Paul said, with an object store, you can have billions of objects, but you can quickly filter them in an index manner to only find the data that you really want to, to work with. Um, another interesting aspect of object storage is a collaboration. So when you use a file system and you want to share the file with somebody else, uh, it's not built in. You may have to push it somewhere else. You may have to uh, create access, uh, username and passwords, try to do an NFS over the internet. In that case, uh, Arteska is AWS compatible with S3. So I'm just using uh, the official AWS command line uh, pointing to my Arteska cluster to generate a URL that will expire automatically after one hour, but that uh, anybody could use without having an account on the system. So when I do this, it generated this key, this uh, URL. And if I were to give it to you, uh, you, you can download that file without prior authentication. So I just download it on my, on my machine. So that's how you can share data between different people working on the same uh, problem. So some of the delegates were kind of uh, bold enough to send me their pictures. So I did uh, the actual alignment. Some, some of the pictures are not all the same quality, but you can see that uh, one of them the, the, the really map. So the original is on the right, the encoded version is on the left. Uh, one of them, uh, the picture wasn't centered, the missing a piece of the picture. So it's kind of a, having some weird artifact, but that's okay. So now I can have you people smile a little bit more or a little bit less <laughs> on that side. <laughs> it's brilliant, Stephen. And we can also play Brilliant. with other directions. Um, like, I think that's the case. So more masculine on the right, uh, more feminine on the left. Amazing.
this is kind of a, the fun part of it. And if you find a useful data point, if somebody wants to know their latent space vector, I can always share them with the uh, object store URLs. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, Dimitrios, I don't know what happened. He, he couldn't go more mail than what you had already. Uh, some ah, you're as male as it gets. Wow. Yeah. Oh, broke. yeah facial broke tattoos, the tattoos are the only way you can get more mail. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me ask a question to you, Paul, or Giorgio, or Brad. If you were to summarize, what is your unique advantages in the AI machine learning and deep machine learning space? What would that be? I think the main thing now is that we've reacted to the market. You know, what, if you looked at us three years ago, we had a very successful object store for dealing with the traditional workloads that fit, right? Archive, long-term backup. Yes, we were doing big data analytics, but it was really about the petabytes of data that were larger and a little bit more quiet, a little less IO intensive. I think the big advantage now is we're coming to you with a system that's really optimized to deal with the performance and the deployment model of these new workloads. And that's our Tesca. Yeah, I, I would just add, I think, I think uh, having algorithms that can really keep your data safe and really keep it online uh, becomes really, really important um, in, the, in this space because um, one of the things we, we've seen is uh, some of these usages are very time sensitive. So being able to have really high uptime and guarantees, really high data guarantees. Those are some of the things that uh, our systems like HDFS were not able to provide. And so I think having really reliable storage that's also really highly available and that isn't so costly uh, that, that you can you can actually use it uh, are really key key points. Obviously, other people make make similar claims, but I think we have some scale examples that show that it it really works. Can we look at the storage services tab of this interface? I'd like to just see you know what all is offered in the interface. Okay. I have I have a related question right about where Artesca actually sits. So I'm looking at the web page. This mm -hmm. is deployed to. Um, uh, just where it's deployed to you as you're talking about this, the storage part. Your, your question is where is Artesca get deployed? Mm -hmm. Anywhere you have uh, Kubernetes, it's microservices and container-based microservices. So you can deploy it on Kubernetes on a bare metal server, on a VM, on the edge, in a, in a smaller location. It's where you need it. So we, we designed it to be portable. Okay. Uh, the, the other thing we haven't shown is that it is multi-cloud aware so it knows how to store data in its own persistence layer its own storage engine but it also knows how to store it in external sources like amazon or azure or google if um, i have one uh, location for artesca right now which is a um, local storage using a block device on the on the vm and then i could create another uh, location give it uh, any name and this is all the different storage that you can use as a backend. So Amazon, Ceph, DigitalOcean, Google Cloud, Azure Blob, an NFS mount, so any existing NFS system, uh, and all the Scality suite of, of uh, storage services, and uh, Wasabi. So whatever gives you, and I can create as many as I want. So it's kind of a, created this new uh, location, which means that uh, from there, uh, I can build workflows around that, and have automated replication from one source to another, have sync between two different uh, sources. Uh, so if I do create, uh, okay, it's still building in the background, so I'm not gonna be able to show right now. But in that page, I can do a transition policy. So let's only keep a certain amount of data on the uh, VM on-prem and everything else goes to a cloud or a central ring. Uh, I could set up DR. Uh, all kind of data flows can be set up from the artist. Okay, you said two words that caught my interest, hot yeah. sync. Are you saying that's synchronous and it doesn't get an act until it's written? Or is it just, it's asynchronous, but very, very small? Oh, it's, uh, it's uh, asynchronous. Asynchronous, okay. Yeah. Let me right. see. Yeah, it's still uh, doing the location. Yeah, but... For replication, we can say that we emulate the Amazon cross-region replication model. Yeah. And we follow their API. The, the difference is we can replicate to multi-targets simultaneously. So you could replicate from an Artesca to two regions in Amazon or Amazon in another cloud.
for the synchronous side, we do have the scality ring that's capable of doing uh, kind of metro area multi-site uh, synchronous um, so that the ACK is, is re received when, when all of the, the sites have, have the data. And that's in production with a number of sites today and, and does provide really high availability and those kind of things that people are looking for as well. That's not an Artesca functionality. And, and these are all separately licensed products. How, how are they licensed? Is it by server, by CPU, by socket? You, you tell me. It's by usable terabyte, usable terabyte. And Artesca is a subscription. So you get a one-year or multi-year subscription, but it's by usable terabyte. So if you tell us you have 100 terabytes, that's what you license. It's free under 50 terabytes. 